Hello again, it's time for another exciting history lecture. Uh, this is on chapter 20, the Mughal Empire. And the Mughal Empire is something that I briefly touched on when I talked about the gunpowder kingdoms, but I didn't go into much detail. And today I want to do that for you here. Now, the Mongol Empire is going to start as the Empire of Timur. And it all came out of this idea, this desire to rebuild the Mongol Empire, the, Mo the Mongol Empire of Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan. Well, in the late 1300s, somebody named Timur, or Timur the Lane, uh, was born in the city of Samarkand. And Samarkand, if you see this mouse pointer, is right there. It was along the Silk Road in what would be today Uzbekistan. And Tamerlane, as he became known as, uh, he claimed to be a descendant of Genghis Khan, even though it was a dubious claim. Uh, he basically kidnapped a member of the Genghis Khan family and made this family member, this descendant of Genghis Khan, say, yeah, he's related to us when he really wasn't. But uh, that was enough to convince people, hey, yeah, he, he's related to Genghis Khan. And Tamerlane is going to begin by conquering the land around his home city of Samarkand. From there, he's going to spread his armies out along the Silk Road. And before you know it, he's taken over uh, cities all along the way. Uh, those cities that are going to surrender peacefully are treated with respect. If you don't treat him peacefully, if you fight back, then he just destroys you, uh, takes your city down to just ruins, and then builds a pyramid out of your skulls to warn the next people, I'm coming. So he really does his best, um, you want to say, he really does his best to encourage you to uh, just surrender without a fight. Now, before you know it, he's going to die, and his kingdom falls apart after Tamerlane's death. But it doesn't fall apart for very long. About two generations later, a person named Baber, or Babur, um, it's the Hindu word for beaver, if I remember correctly, uh, Babur is going to reconquer Samarkand in 1497, and he's going to revive this idea of an empire. And this is what's really going to become the Mughal Empire. Now, what's different between Babur and Tamerlane is Babur really was a descendant of Genghis Khan, and he was also a descendant of Tamerlane, too. So he actually did have the pedigree to, to back up what he was trying to do. And Tamerlane and Genghis Khan put together, Babur really thought, you know, he was destined for greatness. He thought he was destined for political power. And he goes on this wild um, this wild movement of conquering. By 1530, when Babur dies, uh, he controls all of northern India, Uzbekistan, parts of Afghanistan, parts of Pakistan, and I think even parts of like central India as well. Now his son... Humayun is the one who takes control after Babar dies. Uh, Humayun is the one I mentioned in a previous video where he was sick. Babar said, if you save my son, I'll give you my life instead. And Humayun gets better, Babar gets worse, and Humayun lives, Babar dies. Now, it turns out that Humayun is going to be more interested in poetry and astrology. He's not that interested in governing. Uh, he kind of lets things run the way they are. He doesn't get too involved in daily life. And he's so busy with his books that there's this leader from an Afghan tribe named Sher Khan who revolts against him. 
And what's interesting about this is Sher Khan is able to get parts of Humi Yun's own family against him. So not only is it a civil war, but it's a family war too. And this civil war is going to last over 15 years until Humi Yun is able to put it down. Now, eventually, Humi Yun is going to die because he falls down a staircase in his library. Humi Yun had a library on the roof of his palace. And one day, according to legend, he was walking down the stairs of this library carrying a handful of books, a load of books, if you will, and he tripped on his robe, fell down, fell down the stairs, the books landed on top of him, and he smashed his head on one of the stairs. So if anybody tells you books can't kill you, tell them to look up the story of Huma Yun. He died carrying a bunch of books. Now, once Huma Yun is dead, his son is Akbar. And Akbar begins to conquer even more territory than his dad or his grandfather did before. Now, Akbar, he's a little more interested in governing. He is a little bit more hands-on. And Akbar, he's all about religious tolerance. He tries to smooth out the differences between the Islam royalty or Muslim royalty and the Hindu people. He encourages religious tolerance. He encourages everybody to get along. He tries to end any religious wars that might break out or religious fights. And as a sign of how far he would go, uh, Akbar even married a Hindu princess trying to bring the two religions together. Now, the problem is, remember I said he was into conquering? He tries to conquer both Muslim and Hindu princes, and they resist his attempts at being conquered. Now, eventually, all good things come to an end, and the Mughal Empire is going to start its long, slow decline around 1600. Um, around 1600, I believe it's 1603, or maybe it's 1605, Akbar's son, Jahangir, is going to rebel against his father and is going to take over the empire from him. Now, what's really ironic about this is almost as soon as Jahangir takes over from his dad, Jah Jahangir's own sons, try to rebel against him. Now, Jahangir is going to stop the revolt by doing his best Vlad the Impaler impersonation. Jahangir is going to take all of the, as many of the supporters of his sons as they can find, put them on stakes, and then as like a final thumb to the nose, Jahangir makes his defeated sons walk through the field of dead bodies and salute them before they themselves are killed by their dad as being a traitor. Now, there is one son that survives that, attempt, that attempted rebellion, and that's somebody named Jahan, and he becomes known as Shah Jahan. And Shah Jahan kind of takes a, um, a much more heavy-handed approach on the religion. Uh, with Jahangir's armies coming into contact with more and more of the Persian Empire, the Mughals were Sunni Muslim. The Persians were Shiite Muslim, and Sunni and Shiite Muslims don't really get along together. So there's religious tension there. In an attempt to keep the Shiite version of Islam out, Shah Jahan starts to crack down on the different religions. Uh, you have to be a practicing, devout Sunni. <clears throat> In uh, he starts to institute Islamic policies and Islamic laws. And he builds something called the Jama Majid Mosque, which was one of the largest mosques slash hospitals in the world. Now, keeping with tradition, there's another family civil war. 
three of Jahan's four sons die, the surviving son, Arangzeb, or Arangzeb, is going to become the leader of the Mughal Empire. Now this happens because Shah Jahan is actually captured by his son Aurangzeb and forced to live as a prisoner for the last five years of his life. Now Aurangzeb is going to increase the Islamification of India. Aurangzeb is going to institute strict Sharia law, meaning you have to live under the laws of Islam no matter what. Now he didn't force the Hindus to convert but he made it difficult to remain Hindu. Uh, if you did convert to Islam, uh, he would give you gifts, he would give you power, political positions, but if you stayed Hindu, you were forced to pay a special tax, and he started to demolish Hindu temples so there were fewer places for you to worship. Now, by the time Aurangzeb is dead, pretty much everybody hates him, the empire is falling apart because of attacks from the Persian Empire, uh, because the British East India Company is starting to get involved. And with the death of Aurangzeb, in many ways, the Mughal Empire falls with him. Um, it does still exist in some forms, but not in the way it used to. And here are your Mughal Empire, emperors, I should say, just in case you wanted to see what they look like. Uh, this first one right here, Babur, his son Humayun, and then Humayun's son is Akbar. You can see the family resemblance here. On the bottom left, this is Jahangir, his son Shah Jahan, and then the last of these Mughal emperors is Aurangzeb. So that's a visual representation so you can kind of see what they look like. Now let's look real quick at Mughal society. Uh, politics, uh, under for politics, there were four ministries under the emperor. Uh, there is the ministry of the military. There is the ministry of revenue. Uh, legal and religious affairs were put together. And then you had royal affairs that took care of the royal household. You also have provincial governors, and these provincial governors reported directly to the emperor. Underneath the provincial governors were the local mayors, the local townspeople. And then the emperors would give nobles power and prestige based on how useful they were to the emperor. So if you're a noble, you're going to get more power based on how good you are as a military leader, how good your administrative skills were, and how useful you were to your emperor. In exchange for this power, in exchange for this land, the nobles would send tax money up the chain to the emperor. For economics, because that's very often related to politics, uh, originally when the empire started, the government relied on conquest and taking money, taking goods from whoever they conquered, but you can only conquer so much before you start to run out of people to conquer. So once the conquering slowed down and the plunder stopped coming, uh, the government turned to agriculture as their basis for taxation. And because the empire was fairly large and some places could grow crops better than others, the government officials would send in people to survey and estimate how big the harvest for each province would be. And depending on how big the expected harvest was, would decide how much in taxes each province had to pay. So some provinces had to pay more than others depending on how much money or how much food the government thought they would be able to supply. Also, by this time, India is part of the world's economy. There is regular trade between Europe and the Mughal Empire. So there are various East India companies. There's a Dutch East India Company, a French East India Company, a British East India Company. They're all doing business in 
in India. So the Mughal Empire is connected with Europe. There are goods being traded back and forth between Europe and, and um, India. But the Mughal Empire is also going to be connected to the Americas. Another really important thing is the textile industry in India is going to take off. Um, Indian cotton is going to become some of the most sought after cotton in the world. Now religion, and uh, religion involves everyday life, it involves family, it involves pretty much everything. So daily life revolved around the traditional caste system found in Hinduism. So you have your Brahmins at the top, you've got your Kshatriya, your Vyasas, and then your Sudras. In other words, your priest class, uh, your noble warrior class, then you have your... Um, your merchant class, and at the bottom you have your uh, farmer and laborer class. So there's still going to be, even in the 1600s, strict separation of castes, just like there was when Hinduism was founded. Uh, what's really interesting to me is that even if you converted to Islam and you were technically freed from the Hindu caste system, you still lived within that caste system uh, because that's where you are politically and socio-economically, even though you're no longer there religiously. Uh, women, for the most part, are secluded from public life, but there's a lot of private independence. Women are going to be the ones running the household. Women are going to be the ones raising the children, and they have almost complete independence and say on that. Hindus, as I've mentioned a couple times, have legal and religious protections for the most part. Uh, depending on who the emperor is, it's more free than at other times. But uh, Hindus are allowed to continue worshiping according to their traditional beliefs. Uh, there are attempts to convert Hindus to Islam, but it's never forced. It's just made uncomfortable to be a Hindu. Uh, for example, taxes are placed on Hindus. The Hindu temples are taken away, uh, and gifts are given to those who do become Muslim, but never is it forced. And the reason for that is primarily because there is a Hindu majority population being ruled by a Muslim royalty. And if the Muslim royalty ever tried to get rid of Hinduism completely, then it wasn't going to work. For Christians and Jews, they were also protected uh, because in traditional Islamic teachings, Christians and Jews are considered people of the book and they're considered protected under Islamic law. Um, now, that's important because uh, it allowed Christians and Jews into the Mughal Empire, but they were still subject to the same taxes as, as Hindus were. Uh, basically, uh, if you weren't is a member of the Islamic faith, you could practice as you wanted to, but you had to pay a tax for that opportunity. Another thing that's important is because Christians and Jews were considered protected, um, it allowed for friendly relationships between the Mughal Empire and European governments. And this friendly relationship between the Mughal government and specifically the British government is kind of how the British East India Company is going to get into India and start to slowly take it over and turn India into a colony. Now, the last thing to tell you, because that, that's it for, for this lecture here, uh, we are on lesson six, technically, even though it's only the fifth week. It's because we had to do those two lessons last week. Uh, you've got one quiz and then you've got the reflection paper. Now if you don't remember what the reflection paper is, let me pull up your syllabus and show you again. There are a total of four reflection papers to complete during this semester worth 5% each. 
The reflection paper should focus on one of the assigned readings found within the Blackboard Lessons folder. Please use your first paragraph to quickly summarize the article you've chosen to reflect on. For the remainder of the paper, please give your thoughts, opinions, and ideas of the article. The best reflection papers are one and a half to two pages. Make sure you double space it. Provide a clear opinion or idea and is convincing as to why you feel as you do. Now, what did you have to read? You had for chapter 16 or lesson two, you had some stuff to read. Lesson three or chapter 17, however you want to look at it, you had some stuff to read. And then for lesson four and five, chapter 18 and 19, there were also some items you had to read. For example, the De La Casa's Destruction of the Indies, the Turkish Letters, uh, etc., etc., the 95 Theses. What you need to do for your reflection paper is choose one of those readings, go back and read it again, and then kind of tell me what you think of it, uh, what your thoughts on it are, what your opinion of it is. Did you like it? Did you dislike it? Why did you like it? Why did you dislike it? Why do you think it's important? Why do you think I had you read it? Um, and for that first paragraph, just a quick summary. I read the Turkish letters. Um, Bus Kirk explains who the Janissaries were and what his experience with them were. And then he can go on and talk about the Janissaries. They, they were completely unique soldiers. Europeans hadn't seen anything like them. Whatever your opinion might be, I don't want to give you too much because I don't want to influence you. But uh, once again, the most important thing I can say is make sure that you clearly state your opinion. And I don't care if you think it's what I want to hear or not. The purpose of a reflection paper is for you to independently come up with an idea, for you to independently come up with an opinion and be able to clearly say what it is. Now, we all have opinions. We all have favorite colors. We all have favorite cars. We all have favorite grocery stores. I mean... There are opinions for everything. So this is just taking something that you may be unfamiliar with and trying to form an opinion from it. Going forward from there, you'll also notice that we are close to our midterm exam. We will not be in class yet for the midterm exam, so it will be an online midterm. I'll give you some more information on that next week. We're also scheduled, I just found this out earlier today, we are scheduled to come back to class March 1st, but our first class together won't be until March 9th because there is a teacher work day in there. Stay tuned to your emails for more information on that as it is forthcoming. But if you hadn't heard already, I wanted to give you that heads up that uh, it looks like March 1st will be a return to campus. All right, if you have any questions about your reflection paper, email me, and I will answer as quick as I can. But until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Bye.